not have any disease control or survival advantage with an axillary dissection. And more recently updated, um, a, a longer follow-up was published, which verified that that um, equivalence is still persisting over um, a longer period of follow-up time. And ultimately, I think what we're, what we're figuring out is that the systemic therapy, probably more than surgical therapy, is what contributes to our good survival with breast cancer. And I think we still need to answer the question, or I should say there is still some disagreement about what role uh, radiation played in these outcomes. But again, bottom line is for at least this ACASOG Z11 population, debulking a clinically negative uh, axilla was not beneficial for women with limited sentinel node disease. Um, so this is uh, kind of getting into what we saw um, at San Antonio. This was an abstract presented at San Antonio from the Netherlands, and they were specifically looking at um, how do we incorporate axillary imaging into this post Z11 era. You know, ultimately, you know, what sentinel node was great. We did sentinel node. If it was positive, women went on to an axillary dissection. If it was negative, they didn't. And because that potentially meant two different surgeries or two surgical steps, we started to use axillary imaging as a way to identify axillary disease so we could bypass the sentinel node step, just go on to axillary dissection. And after Z11 was published, we really didn't have as good of a handle on how to use that axillary imaging. So a lot of people started arguing against axillary imaging since even if the sentinel node was positive, that might have been the only surgery we were going to do anyway. Um, these investigators in the Netherlands were actually arguing for continuing the use of axillary imaging even in a patient um, who might otherwise um, just be going to a sentinel node biopsy. And they looked at a large population um, of patients, and um, these were patients who were all found to be pathologically node positive at, uh, an ax and, and did undergo axillary dissection. And about two-thirds of these patients were identified with axillary disease first on their sentinel node biopsy and about a third on an ultrasound-guided needle biopsy following abnormal axillary ultrasound. And what they found is that the patients who were diagnosed with their axillary disease using percutaneous biopsy were older, they had um, higher T-stage, higher grade tumors, more likely ER negative tumors, um, and overall they had a higher number of positive nodes, so typically a greater end stage. It also had worse overall survival. And so what these authors concluded is that um, you can't apply Z11 data to women who have positive ultrasound-guided lymph node disease. And, and so their argument was that, you know, even if you think someone might be a candidate for, for going down the Z11 pathway, if you've got enough disease that it shows up on an axillary ultrasound, you may need to rethink that, um, you know, that decision. Um, there is some, I think, selection bias in this paper. I mean, first of all, these are all um, node-positive patients. They also never define the clinical stage of these patients. So, and again, this is, of course, just the abstract, but there's been nothing to say that these were all clinically node-negative patients. So we don't know, for instance, why the women who underwent ultrasound-guided biopsy, why they had to get that biopsy in the first place. You know, were they clinically node-positive? This is a much smaller study that was published a couple of years ago showing very much the similar thing, looking at the axillary node burden for patients who were diagnosed by core biopsy of the uh, axillary node versus sentinel node biopsy. And again, very small study. Um, but similarly, they show that the ultrasound-guided needle biopsy patients were older and had uh, more advanced disease. Um, they had more aggressive disease by biomarkers and they had higher end stage, so more lymph node disease or more lymph node burden. They did not perform any survival analysis in their study. That same year, um, another uh, study was published, again, looking at axillary nodal disease for patients who had positive FNAs um, after uh, they underwent axillary ultrasound. Um, and again, this was this, uh, like, like the uh, abstract published uh, or presented at San Antonio, they were really looking to figure out how to best manage axillary imaging in the Z11 era. So they looked at 350 patients who had abnormal axillary ultrasounds who subsequently also had positive fineal aspiration, and all of those patients went on to axillary dissection. And ultimately, they found that the median number of positive nodes at axillary dissection was four, which sounds kind of high. Um, you know, we're getting into N2 disease at that point. Um, they ultimately found that 12% of their patients had no positive nodes on axillary dissection, and the vast majority of those were women who were found to be node positive, subsequently treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and then converted to node negative. 
Um, so again, uh, a lot of women who had documented axillary disease who ultimately had normal lymph nodes removed because of neoadjuvant therapy. We're going to talk about that um, in a little bit more detail here as well. So interestingly, they then applied Z11 criteria to this cohort. So they basically said, okay, so of these patients, um, which patients would have been eligible for Z11 and if we had, you know, skipped the axillary ultrasound fine needle aspiration, who could have actually avoided the axillary dissection if we had taken them down a Z11 pathway? And um, based on patients undergoing mastectomy or being treated with neoadjuvant therapy, those sorts of things, they ultimately found a very small subset of their population um, that would have been a candidate for um, the Z11 inclusion criteria. So ultimately, they determined that 27 patients, or 6.25% of the patients who had the positive fine needle aspiration um, would have been eligible for Z11, could have undergone only sentinel node biopsy and skipped the axillary dissection. And so because of this, they ultimately determined that um, you still should be using the preoperative um, imaging um, because so few of those patients are going to be able to avoid axillary dissection. And what I would point out, um, because again, they're arguing to, you know, do the imaging and take patients straight to axillary dissection. I would argue, though, that 27 patients could have been spared an axillary dissection. So for 27 women, granted that may be a small percentage, but you know, those women could have been spared a more morbid surgery. Um, and also add that they excluded patients um, from their potential Z11 criteria based on extracapsular extension um, on their uh, lymph node pathology. And just um, as a clarification, we often see extracapsular extension defined in um, axillary surgery specimens, but that was not truly an exclusion criteria in Z11. The exclusion criteria in Z11 was gross matted disease. And so um, uh, microscopic extracapsular extension really does not um, make women um, uneligible for um, the application of Z11 data. Um, so they also had uh, you know, a third of these patients had a pathologic complete response after their treatment with neoadjuvant therapy. So again, that's a third of women um, who had neoadjuvant uh, therapy who, you know, basically had completely normal lymph nodes removed. So um, in conclusion, you know, I would argue this is, this is a very small amount of the data to suggest um, that axillary surgery really can be minimized. Um, and again, there's, there's data beyond Z11, other studies, including retrospective studies, and again, now longer follow-up with Z11. Um, and again, there are a few caveats. We don't really know what the role of radiation is, but bottom line is, you know, we, even if you uh, know that there are some people who will have axillary disease, it's the removal of all that axillary disease that I'm not convinced we really need to do, and we need to really look at what is our impact on outcome. Because we can say, hey, these women with positive ultrasounds or positive fine needle aspirations had more lymph node disease, but ultimately, how does our surgery really improve their outcome? So I think this is kind of a jumping off point um, for looking at this in more detail in the study of neoadjuvant systemic therapy. So uh, with neoadjuvant therapy, typically, you know, one of the indications we do it is for patients who have locally advanced breast cancer. So um, you know, say you document your lymph node disease, um, and then patients go on to neoadjuvant systemic therapy. And for patients who still have clinically positive lymph node disease, I don't think there's any question that those women should go on to a complete axillary dissection. I mean, those are patients who have continued to have axillary disease despite systemic therapy treatment. And I'll talk a little bit about the clinical trials that are addressing that in more detail. But I think a bigger population that we're seeing a lot of are the women who convert to clinically node negative. So these are the patients, again, who have documented node disease, they undergo neoadjuvant systemic therapy, and then they become clinically node negative. So again, I'm lumping these into early stage breast cancer disease in the post-neoadjuvant setting. Um, I just want to kind of highlight our, our guidelines in the NCCN, and, and it was actually really tough at the panel to, to come to a consensus on this, but ultimately, for patients who are expected to undergo neoadjuvant therapy, the recommendation is that um, we should really consider doing some sort of imaging on the axilla just to get a sense of what axillary stage is before women start systemic treatment. And if lymph nodes are suspicious, you know, we really recommend that they undergo a core biopsy or a fine needle aspiration to document what is going on in those lymph nodes. And even more than for surgery, I think this does have big implications for our radiation oncologists. 
Um, ultimately, we do allow the fact that if patients do have documented lymph node disease before uh, systemic therapy and they are clinically node negative after, it is very reasonable to perform a sentinel node biopsy at the time of their definitive surgery rather than going straight to axillary dissection. So why do we say this? There are a few studies that have led us to this. So um, sentinel node biopsy after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the early experience was really limited in small studies, and they had very um, mixed rates um, of reported sentinel node identification and of uh, the rate of false negative sentinel nodes. And NSABP B27 actually had a small sub-study. So this was one of the uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy trials, and all of these patients were treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and they all had a complete axillary dissection. And a subset of the surgeons in this trial, although this was not part of the trial design, they just decided to go ahead and try the sentinel node before moving on to the, um, to the mandatory axillary dissection. And there were over 400 patients um, who underwent this, this dual procedure, and what they found is that the identification rate of a sentinel node in this setting was 89% when both isotope and flu dye were used. And the false negative rate was less than 10% when, again, both of those um, dye modalities were used. So overall, pretty good and not too different from what we see in the upfront surgery performance characteristics. A meta-analysis was published um, about that time a little bit after, which looked at over 1,200 patients. And this meta-analysis found overall a 90% sentinel node identification rate and a 12% false negative rate. Um, so a little bit higher than what we saw in that B27 sub-study, but overall um, pretty acceptable false negative rate and identification rate. Another meta-analysis was done um, a few years after. Um, this updated meta-analysis had a larger percentage of patients um, and, again, overall about a 90% identification rate and a slightly better false negative rate, less than 10%. Uh, MD Anderson looked at their own institutional data, and their results are actually some of the best reported, but they looked at about 600 patients, and their identification rate for uh, sentinel nodes was actually um, almost 95%, and their false negative rate was 6%. And interestingly, they then looked at over 3,000 patients who underwent primary sentinel node biopsy, so not after neoadjuvant therapy, um, within that same period of time, and they actually found not significantly different sentinel node identification or false negative rates. And then they looked at survival analysis and disease recurrence analysis, both for patients who underwent the post-neo or, or pre-adjuvant therapy sentinel node biopsy, and they found absolutely no difference in the outcomes um, regardless of the timing of that sentinel node biopsy. So all of this, I think, was, you know, kind of a um, launching off point and, and data to support the multi-institutional ACASOG V1071 trial which was a single arm uh, study in which patients were documented with their lymph node disease, and this did include patients with clinically N1 and N2 disease. They were treated with neoadjuvant systemic therapy, and then uh, assuming they converted to node negative, underwent sentinel node biopsy with axillary dissection. And ultimately, they found really good um, performance characteristics. So they uh, found uh, the false negative rates uh, with uh, the use of both blue dye and isotope of about 11%. Um, that went down to below 10% if three or more sentinel nodes were removed and if documentation of the uh, previously biopsy lymph node, um, you know, was confirmed. They also reported a nodal path complete response rate of about 40%, and we're going to see this through a lot of these studies. So a, a decent section, you know, segment of women who are treated with neoadjuvant therapy are ultimately converted to truly pathologically node negative. So the authors concluded that sentinel node biopsy actually is a pretty valid approach to women who have been treated with neoadjuvant systemic therapy. You just have to pay attention to the surgical uh, technique in order to make it as good as we see um, in the uh, uh, pre or the non post neoadjuvant setting. Um, so, uh, you know, kind of where are we going um, now from here? These are two ongoing studies I just wanted to mention. So, these are patients who, again, like Z1071, they are documented as being node positive and they are treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And patients undergo sentinel node biopsy. And if their sentinel node is negative, then what these studies um, are kind of designed to do is to figure out, can we start to apply the Z11 criteria in this post-neoadjuvant setting 
So for Sentinel notes that um, are negative, patients are then eligible to head over to the sister study, which is an energy study. And those patients who have converted to node negative will be randomized to regional nodal radiation versus no regional nodal radiation. For patients who have remained node positive and their post neoadjuvant sentinel node is positive, those patients will be randomized to axillary dissection versus no uh, uh, axillary surgery, although both arms in that setting would get uh, regional lymph node radiation. So these trials are ongoing to help get a better sense of, uh, you know, how, how much surgery, how much radiation we need in the post neoadjuvant setting. So uh, this is, uh, again, back to uh, San Antonio, one of the abstracts presented in San Antonio, which was uh, looking at, um, again, patients that can be spared axillary dissection after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And this is a meta-analysis that looked at um, about uh, 3,400 patients. And again, this kind of like Z1071 was looking at performance characteristics of sentinel node um, in that population of patients. And they found that the pooled false negative rate was 13%. They found um, an adjusted pathologic complete response rate in the lymph nodes of 47%. So ultimately, their conclusion was that uh, LIGA Z1071, sentinel node biopsy, was um, certainly a valid option for biopsy-proven node-positive patients um, who are then treated with neoadjuvant therapy. And they also actually commented that although it's a bit worse um, than the not post-neoadjuvant sentinel node biopsy um, performance, a false negative rate of 13% they felt was unlikely to adversely affect overall survival, and they recommended further uh, powered studies to determine whether, you know, that, that difference actually impacts outcomes. Um, but again, overall good performance in this meta-analysis. Um, the Sentina study in Germany, um, similarly, they looked at a subset um, of patients in that study to try to just get a sense of who was still going to be node positive after their neoadjuvant chemo. I don't want to go through all the details of this in the interest of time, but basically there are characteristics that help us predict which patients treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy might still be node positive after treatment versus those that might still be node negative. And ultimately the big things in their model were ER status, disease multifocality, lymphovascular invasion, um, whether or not a sentinel node could even be detected after neoadjuvant therapy, and then tumor size. So again, some predictors of, uh, of who might still have residual axillary disease. Um, this is a, a retrospective study from London presented at San, presented at San Antonio. Um, and again, these were uh, patients um, who uh, had suspicious lymph nodes, underwent lymph node biopsy, and then underwent um, chemotherapy. And uh, they found um, specifically kind of the, the point of this is that patients who had residual disease in their lymph nodes often still had residual disease in the breast. So um, again, it's not really a one-to-one -one, um, comparison, but if patients still have disease in the breast, they are more likely to still have residual disease in the axilla. So again, hopefully kind of giving us some, some way to guide patients about who might still need more extensive axillary surgery or who still may have axillary disease after their chemo. Um, this is a, 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 another study, again, looking at um, uh, sentinel node biopsy and how well it predicts a uh, disease for patients who have had neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, again, this is just kind of more data piling up here, um, and they showed a, uh, a sensitivity of 84% and a false negative rate of 8% um, for the patients enrolled in this study. Um, so again, overall fairly good performance. Ultimately, all of this data together, I think, shows that um, Chemotherapy, one of the benefits of doing neoadjuvant chemotherapy is downstaging a tumor. And we're pretty quick to adopt that in the breast, right? We offer neoadjuvant therapy to women all the time to make disease more resectable or to make a woman a candidate for breast conservation. So maybe we should be kind of going into it um, uh, with uh, the axilla in mind as well. So ideally, we can use neoadjuvant chemotherapy really to downstage the axilla and to minimize our axillary surgery the way we use it to minimize our breast surgery. I'd also highlight that, you know, almost half of the women in most of these studies have a pathologic complete response and are basically having completely normal lymph nodes removed otherwise. Um, especially women who are triple negative and who have HER2 positive tumors, those women have a really good chance of not needing such extensive axillary surgery. So at our institution, we're pretty quick to offer them neoadjuvant therapy, specifically with the design of minimizing their axillary surgery. 
these studies also show that they're predictors of residual axillary disease, which I think really can, can help us counsel women. So who actually needs an axillary dissection and who doesn't need any axillary surgery at all? So um, in our, the, the panel in the NCCM guidelines actually recommend that for, for patients who are clinically node positive, you know, especially if it's confirmed, they should have an axillary dissection. We also technically recommend an axillary dissection in the setting of non-identified sentinel lymph nodes. So basically, if you can't get the staging information with the sentinel node, do the axillary dissection. And I hope over time we're going to move away from that. Interestingly, although, although we have that recommendation, we kind of turn around and say that for patients in whom axillary staging information is unlikely to uh, impact our adjuvant therapy recommendation, it's okay to skip it. So again, I think we, we need to um, kind of come to a consensus about what we're doing with the information obtained with the axillary surgery and who actually can, can skip it. Um, I just want to point out that um, uh, SSO um, Choosing Wisely campaign actually specifically recommends not routinely using sentinel node biopsy for a specific subset of elderly women with hormone receptive positive breast cancer. Again, I think we just need to start asking what are we doing with that information? So is the information obtained with the sentinel node biopsy always needed in the setting of a clinically negative axilla? And I think the answer to that is no. So this is a, an abstract presented at San Antonio, and they actually um, looked at women who had failure of the sentinel node to map. So this kind of goes back again to our NCCN guidelines, which say, hey, the sentinel node doesn't map. We should do an axillary dissection to get that stage information. And this was a, a huge population-based study that ultimately included over 100,000 women, and the non-visualized sentinel node biopsy rate was 2.5%. And it was associated with um, uh, increasing age, earlier treatment, so again, less familiarity and expertise with sentinel node biopsy as a procedure, increased T stage, increased number of involved, of, uh, involved nodes. And ultimately, of those women who had no visualized sentinel nodes, 84% of them did go on to an axillary dissection. And again, for patients who went on to axillary dissection, um, more likely to be treated earlier on in this, in this um, period of time. These authors then actually sent out a questionnaire to the surgeons um, you know, in, in the Netherlands, basically to get a sense of when and why they would default to an axillary dissection if they can't find a sentinel node. And what they found is that over time, surgeons are increasingly less likely to default to an axillary node dissection. Um, so again, I, I think people are starting to feel that maybe we didn't need that information quite as much. So um, like the memorial stone cuttering nomogram, you know, there are uh, other being developed. You know, these, this is a newer nomogram designed to predict which patients aren't going to have any sentinel node disease at all. And again, this is very much like uh, the memorial stone cuttering nomogram, so I'm not going to go into that in the interest of detail. But again, there are, there are ways to get a sense of who is and who isn't going to have axillary disease. So in addition to nomograms, can we use imaging to give us a sense of what is pathologically going on in the axilla without actually taking lymph nodes out? And this was uh, presented at San Antonio. It's a paper from Singapore. And what they did is they looked at the performance characteristics of axillary ultrasound. And they found overall ultrasound sensitivity of 75%, specificity of 91%, and a false negative rate of 25%, which is um, not too dissimilar than what we see in um, the American literature. Um, these performance characteristics can be a bit variable. But they added elastography to 70 of these cases. And this is a technology I'm not familiar with. We don't perform it at, at my institution. But the uh, addition of elastography to axillary ultrasound really did improve the performance characteristics, especially the specificity of axillary ultrasound. So again, potentially a way to non-invasively um, get a better uh, imaging sense of what's going on in the axilla. Another paper presented at San Antonio actually used uh, both ultrasound and uh, elastography to evaluate sentinel nodes after they were actually removed from women. And what they found is that this uh, combination of technology was actually very good at identifying disease in lymph nodes when combining the size of the lymph nodes, the stiffness of the lymph nodes as measured by elastography, and the ratio between those two values. So again, pretty easily predictive. And although these were in lymph nodes that were removed, Hopefully we can do this um, in vivo as well. 
Uh, this last year, we actually published our own institutional data looking at axillary ultrasound, and um, we had about 650 patients who underwent axillary ultrasound. Um, these were, again, early stage breast cancer patients. And uh, kind of like the other data out there, our sensitivity uh, was 70%, so not, not great. But what, when we look at just what we would consider clinically significant disease, so macrometastatic disease or tumor deposits in lymph nodes of greater than two millimeters, axillary ultrasound performance actually was better. Sensitivity of 76% and a negative predictive value of 89%. We actually then took our cases where the axillary ultrasound was falsely negative and missed disease and created a matching cohort of patients who had a truly negative axillary ultrasound. Um, we took all their um, uh, clinical and pathologic features and actually had two blind and medical oncologists make disease recommendations for these patients, assuming that they were node negative, even though, again, half of them had a false negative axillary ultrasound and truly did have axillary disease. And what we found is that there was no significant difference between the oncologist or between what the blinded oncologist recommended and what the patient actually um, was recommended or actually received um, in, real, in real life based on a false negative actually ultrasound. Basically, it didn't matter. Um, and the survival statistics actually show that a false negative actually ultrasound did not impact um, um, uh, disease-free uh, survival um, compared to a um, uh, a true negative axillary ultrasound. So the, the big determinant of survival was having lymph node disease. Really didn't matter whether or not the ultrasound missed it. Um, it was just the presence of disease itself. Um, so this is a, a paper from Anna Rundle that was um, presented um, two years ago. And they, again, were looking at axillary ultrasound and how it performs for identifying axillary disease. And they specifically wanted to see if it could rule out more significant axillary disease. Um, and they, again, found very good performance characteristics. So um, they found um, the uh, sensitivity of axillary ultrasound for predicting at least three positive lymph nodes was 71%, specificity a bit better at 83%. And the false negative rate for identifying, you know, that um, uh, three or more positive lymph nodes was 4%. It was really pretty good, although it was worse for lobular cancers. Um, and lobular cancers, as we know, in the lymph nodes as in the breast, can be pretty subtle and um, kind of underreported or under-visualized in the imaging. And um, in the paper from Anna Rundle, they summarized the literature looking at axillary ultrasound performance, and multiple other authors did also find that lobular histology may make axillary ultrasound a bit less reliable. So um, as far as, you know, we've got some imaging that might be able to kind of help us uh, um, get a sense of what's going on the, in, the, in the axilla. So can we actually just rely on that alone? And there are a few trials going on looking at, looking at that. Um, so again, relying on imaging alone. This is a trial underway in Germany right now, and it's patients who have uh, normal axillary ultrasounds randomized to a sentinel node biopsy versus absolutely no surgery of the axilla. Um, this trial is actively accruing. And actually, a similar trial was started first in Italy. This is called the SOUND trial. And again, this includes women who have normal axillary ultrasound or borderline axillary ultrasound but have a negative fine needle aspiration. These patients randomized to axillary uh, sentinel node biopsy versus no axillary surgery. And this past year, we actually published our own institutional data. It's a very similar trial. This was a pilot trial that included um, 66 patients, and these were patients with normal axillary ultrasound randomized to sentinel node biopsy or no sentinel node biopsy. And um, I do need to update our follow-up data, um, but uh, basically what we found is that the uh, negative predictive value for macrometastatic disease was 97%. So far, we haven't had any recurrences, and again, we have actually about an additional year of follow-up um, since uh, this data was um, uh, um, since we uh, wrote the manuscript. But still, um, no disease recurrences. And the axillary ultrasound, if it did miss disease, it missed it in three patients, two of which were micrometastatic and therefore we would consider clinically insignificant. Uh, the one patient who had missed macrometastatic disease actually had a failed sentinel node mapping and had a replaced upper outer quadrant lymph node. Um, so in conclusion, I would say that axillary imaging does miss some axillary disease, including macrometastatic disease. We know this. We might be able to predict who is going to have more or less axillary disease. And axillary staging findings may inform adjuvant therapy decisions 
But increasingly, these decisions are being made based on tumor biology. And we saw that with our, our blinded medical oncologist cohort and our institutional data, and actually the upcoming AJCC staging um, for breast cancer is going to start incorporating not only the anatomy, like the TNM stage, but tumor biology as a means of, of more refining the way we stage and, and treat breast cancer. And ultimately, I think our big question is, if we omit axillary surgery, maybe we're going to miss a little bit of data or a little bit of staging information, but bottom line is, does it make a difference? Um, does it really impact survival or disease recurrence? And so far, the data is suggesting that it may not. And being able to save women from the general anesthesia and the potential morbidities, I think, is certainly a really valuable question. And I'm excited that there are a lot of people um, looking at answering that. So the rest of my slides are uh, about uh, disease recurrence. So um, I would like to thank you all, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Sear. We had a few questions come in during the presentation. Uh, they should be in your Q&A module under my Q&A. Um, we received actually a good number of them, but for anyone else who would like to submit a question, please use the Q&A module to submit your questions to the speaker. Uh, we, due to time constraints, we may not be able to answer all the questions, but we appreciate any that you are willing to submit. Okay. And just looking at, at some of these here, um, so one question is, how do we define axillary micrometastasis? So the definition between micro and metastatic or macro metastatic lymph node disease is typically two millimeters. So two millimeters or less is considered micro metastatic, and based on um, some large uh, trials, we know that um, that does have some impact on prognosis. But additional surgery basically isn't needed. So we don't really make treatment decisions based on two millimeters or less of disease in the axilla. Um, another question here, um, after preoperative systemic therapy for a clinically node negative patient, how many lymph nodes do we re need to remove for a sentinel node biopsy? So based on ACASOG Z1071, um, the performance of post post-neoadjuvant sentinel node biopsy is significantly better if you remove at least three sentinel nodes. Um, now, what if a patient has always been node negative and you want to do your sentinel node biopsy after neoadjuvant chemo? Um, those, you know, these, these other studies that have looked at performance of sentinel node have looked at patients that were both node negative and node positive, and, and I don't think we have as good of a handle on how many lymph nodes we should remove for a sentinel node biopsy when a patient has always looked node negative. Um, I will say that, that personally, I don't worry necessarily about removing at least three if I have always thought the lymph nodes were, were negative, especially for someone in whom, um, you know, they, they're you know, like again, triple negative patients, patients who are HER2 positive. So, say, you know, they, you know, they did have some unsuspected lymph node disease. It's a lot um, more likely uh, that uh, they're they're no negative at that time. So, so again, I, you know, ideally, I would remove at least at least two sentinel nodes. But for a patient in whom you knew there was lymph node disease, I think three or more nodes really is ideal based on 1071. Um, let's see here. Um, let's see. So for patients who have core biopsies of suspected axillary lymph nodes, are CLIPS considered the standard of care? Um, and then if these patients have uh, neoadjuvant therapy and complete resolution of their adenopathy, does the CLIP help identify the node in question? Um, so I don't know that clipping lymph nodes specifically is the standard of care, but I think it is, it is heading in that direction. Um, there are still places that are not clipping lymph nodes, and what Z1071 showed us is that removing and documenting that you've removed a clipped lymph node gives you the best false negative rate. It's down to about 7%. You can get pretty good, though, and pretty close by removing at least three sentinel nodes. And so, um, you know, and, and certainly using both blue dye and radio tracer, I think, is important. So say your radiologists don't want to clip lymph nodes. I think you've got these other techniques to kind of help improve the performance of your sentinel node after, after chemo. Um, we have recently started clipping nodes, though, and I do think it's very helpful. The problem is, what if you don't get your clipped lymph node out? Do you do a needle lobe? Do you default to an axillary dissection? And I think the management of that is variable and up for debate. Um, 
I don't necessarily default to an axillary dissection, but I worry a little bit more about a higher pulse uh, negative, right? And you have to discuss that with patients. And if you don't want to do clips, um, there are other options. So some people are using radioactive seeds or um, the, you know, a, a radio, like a, a like a reflector device to identify the node. Some people are also using um, India ink tattooing, uh, much like is done um, in, um, you know, colonoscopy with subsequent um, colon resection. That, that's another option for figuring out if you remove the, the biopsy lymph node. And pathologists can also look and tell you if they have any treatment change or biopsy change when you remove lymph nodes. So I think those are all options. Um, let's see here. Um, let's see. Does PET CT have a predictive role for um, as an axillary imaging modality? Um, there, there is a little bit of data on that, but I, I think it's mixed. And part of the problem is that um, PET typically needs to have at least a centimeter of disease to be, you know, considered accurate, or um, you know, so that you're not worrying about missing things and you know, most of the time, if, if you've got at least a centimeter of, of disease in the lymph node, you're going to find it with some other modality. So at this point in time, I would not say that that is as accurate as axillary ultrasound or, or even MRI, um, breast MRI. So it might, it might identify things, but I wouldn't rely on it to rule disease out in the axilla. Um, Here's uh, another uh, uh, question. So are we applying Z11 data to mastectomy patients? Um, so basically, are we omitting axillary dissection for the patients who have minimal sentinel node disease but who are not undergoing breast conservation with whole breast radiation, which was the um, inclusion criteria for Z11? Um, right now, I think we're mixed. Um, I think there are some people who do and some people who don't. And I think a lot of it depends on um, any of their indications for radiation. So if you've got a young patient, lymphovascular invasion, she's triple negative, those sorts of things, she's going to get radiation regardless. At that point, we kind of start to default to the Amarose data, which suggests that axillary radiation is a good replacement for axillary dissection. So a lot of times we won't go back if there's another indication for radiation, um, expecting those patients to get regional lymph node radiation. Um, let's see here. Um, let's see. Um, is there any role for fine needle aspiration or core biopsy for clinically negative nodes instead of sentinel node biopsy? Um, I, I assume that question means, um, you know, if, if lymph nodes look totally normal, do you FNA or core them? I would say no. Um, I, I think if the imaging is normal, again, the performance is pretty good, you would at that point consider patients clinically node negative. So, all right. And I think those are um, most of the questions that we've gotten. And we are running a little over the scheduled end time. So um, let's, let's make a few concluding remarks, Dr. Sarah. I can wrap everything up. Um, I think I think it's good. I'd like to thank everybody for, um, for their interest today and hope they found it helpful. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your presentation and for answering the questions during the Q&A. And thank you to those who submitted questions during the Q&A session. As a reminder for um, what I mentioned during the introductory remarks, you'll receive an email within five days from the NCCN Continuing Education Department with information on how to uh, complete the post test and evaluation to claim credit for the activity. Um, this webinar is part of a series of webinars. If you have not registered for the other topics, we welcome you to do so. More information on uh, uh, presentation dates, times, topics, and speakers can be found at nccn.org slash events. And also on this slide are a few other ways to connect with NCCN online and social media. Thank you all for your participation in today's program. Dr. Sear, thank you again. This concludes today's webinar, and I hope you all have a wonderful day and a great weekend.